Good morning, Santa Clarita. Welcome in. You are listening to KHTS, your hometown station, 98.1 FM and 1220 AM. This is SCDI and I lead schools Eye on the Valley. I am your host, Matt Watson. Welcome in. It is good to have you. Phew. It is Friday again already. Engineer Patty, happy Friday to you, sir. How you doing? Doing fantastic, Maddie. Um, how is your Friday, sir? Yeah, you know, Fridays are, 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 are never bad. You know, I'm glad to hear that you're doing well. But, Always. Uh, you know, for me, it, it's already, I know it's just past 8 o'clock in the morning, but it's already been a chaotic morning for me, you know. I, I, I know, Patty, you're, you're still out there living your best life, coming into the studio every day and then heading over to your side hustle uh, after this. But uh, Absolutely. You know, like most Southern Californians, we're, you know, we're sitting at home all day, living, the, living our life on Zoom in their pajamas. And, and then, you know, when Friday does come around, they're running around the house looking for a pair of pants so that they can get to the radio station on time without embarrassing themselves. Am I right? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I'm wearing the fancy pants for it today, well, too. There you go. Maybe, maybe that's just me. Maybe it's not every Southern California. But at any rate... Whether you are in your PJs all day or rocking that Armani suit, chances are, if you can hear my voice, you're somewhere in SoCal, and there is no better place to be than in SoCal right now, because, uh, you know, here we are, it's, it's mid-January, it is January 15th today, right? And it's, it's going to be in the 80s today, we could push mid-80s today, this is awesome town indeed. I'm, I'm wearing sandals here for crying out loud, so... It is Friday. It is a beautiful day in the valley, and you know we love to celebrate the holidays. It's National Hat oh, Day. Oh, that's why the there hat. There we go. It Got is it. National Hat Day. That's right. Happy National Hat Day, Patty. I, I see that you do not observe the holiday, but uh, uh, I wish I could wear a hat to, <laughs> to, to, to the side hustle. I wish I could. <laughs> But uh, uh, that is uh, what they would call uh, frowned upon. Right, right, right. <laughs> but you know what? If if you're tuning in on on your on on our Facebook live feed, that is KHTS Radio page on Facebook, you, you'll see that I'm observing the day, right? No, I, I'm not just some poor slob who couldn't pull myself together uh, on the one day of the work that I actually have to leave the house and and just threw a hat on. And and no, I'm not one of those guys whose hair has just gone absolutely out of control because. The salons have been closed for far too long. Nope, nope, not me. I am a romantic at heart who loves to celebrate the holidays. So this morning, I took a long, hard look at my hat closet. Yeah, that's right, Engineer Andrew. I've got an entire closet dedicated to hats. I looked long and hard, and I was thinking, do I go with the 2020 World Championship Dodgers cap, or do I go with the Puerto Rican Hiwato on this sunny day, or the classic fedora? It's much too warm out there for me to be rocking my grunge rock beanie. Um, so after cons considerate deliberation, I decided to go with the old school throwback. That's right. I'm wearing the SCBI original baseball cap. Uh, goes all the way back to 2015. Yeah, I know that that doesn't seem very old school to some, but, you know, it's all a matter of perspective, you know. So... Happy National Hat Day. And if, you, if you're getting out of the shower right now and, 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 you know, you don't feel like doing your hair, maybe it's gotten a little unruly like mine, maybe you, you want to go for a, a way casual Friday, you go right ahead. It's National Hat Day. And if the boss gives you any grief, you tell her that you're not dressing down, you're being festive. Just like that clown who wore antlers on his head the entire month of December. Nobody said anything to him. So, Friday... Sunny day in SoCal, National Hat Day, and if that weren't enough, wait till you hear the kind of show that we've got for you today. It's an important show for you to be tuning in. We're, we're focusing on a couple of the more pressing topics in our state, our nation, and here in the Valley today. We're talking education, and, uh, and we'll be talking with a couple of teachers who are, who are making a huge impact in the lives of their students. Deja Mun and Ali Benedetti from I Lead Agua Dulce, and we're talking medicine, we're talking hospitals. In hour number two, we're gonna be talking to Dr. Tracy Bud Lawrence, medical director of the emergency department at Henry Mayo Newhall Memorial Hospital. We've had Dr. Lawrence on before and he's fantastic, very personable, very knowledgeable. And, but that was back in June when we had him on the show and when he was reporting no real problems at Henry Mayo. Things were, were going pretty smoothly. Well, you all know that this virus has gone well, it's gone viral, right? 
uh, this, these last couple of months. So we'll get caught up with him, see how they're doing at the hospital. We do have a great show today, a great day, a great hat. So, so let's get to it. My first guest today comprised the middle school teaching team at Eilid Agua Dulce Charter School on the east side of the valley here. Deja Munn is a no-cal girl who's been captivated by the allure of SoCal. An alum of, the U, of UC Santa Cruz, this banana slug double majored in biology and environmental studies, receiving honors for her thesis. Check this out, Patty. She received honors for her thesis on paleoecology and taphonomy. Yeah, Google it. I don't know. Deja, <laughs> Deja earned her teaching credential from the University of Laverne, becoming the fourth generation of teachers in her family. She's a true citizen of the world who attended first grade in Jamaica and lived in Brussels for three years, along with multiple states across the country. Deja has also visited Belize, Canada, Morocco, Puerto Rico, all of Western Europe. She truly puts the eye in eye lead and has a passion for not just teaching, but for mentoring youth. And her partner, Ali Benedetti, who hails from the Antelope Valley. She bleeds blue and yellow from Quartz Hill High School. She was a rebel, but they're not rebels anymore. Allie received her bachelor's degree from CSUN and her teaching credential from the Cal State Bakersfield. She did her student teaching at a school on the west side, joining Eilid Agua Dulce last school year uh, to team teach with Deja. And she's quickly shown that she is an energetic and dynamic educator who has a knack for captivating the interest of her students. Deja, Allie, welcome to Eye on the Valley. Hi, thank, thank you for having us. Hey, take Great to be here. <laughs> it's good to have you. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining us. So first of all, um, I, I touched on it a little bit, but let's uh, let's share a little bit more about your, your your stories. I'd like to know how each of you found iLead. Allie, let's start with you. Uh, as I mentioned, you uh, are, are, are newish to iLead. You joined us last year. How did you uh, how'd you come across us? How did you find iLead? Uh, well, I had finished my credential, and as everybody does in this position, you start looking for a job and trying to find your fit. And I subbed all around the Antelope Valley for uh, almost every district, and I was really looking for that best fit for me on how I wanted to be able to teach and reach the kids. And um, meeting Lisa Latimer and... Um, interviewing with her, the school just really fit in how I wanted to be able to um, approach each kid and um, really teach them where they were and, and facilitate with them and go on the pathway wherever they were starting to wherever they needed to go. And it was just um, the fact that, you know, I lead Agua Dulce encourages play and involvement and really just the PBL lifestyle is really what I was drawn to and I wanted to be a part of. When you talk about fit, boy, you, you did fit right in and, and just kind of took to it like a, uh, a fish to water and, and have made a, a huge impact in, in a really short time at, uh, at your school and, and in our organization. But, Deja, you've been around a, a little bit longer than, than Allie. In fact, I, I believe you were with our organization from what they call year zero. Deja, uh, talk to us a little bit about your journey with iLead Schools and how you found us and how you got started and, and then share a little bit of, uh, of your journey because it's been a journey. It definitely has. It's been long and, and I've been reflecting on that a lot this year, especially uh, my own two kids are uh, one is a senior in high school, my son and my daughter is a sophomore in college. And when they were in preschool, uh, I started hearing about this amazing school that was uh, trying to get started in Santa Clarita. And my kids were at a whole child child-led, play-based, multi-age preschool. And as soon as I started hearing about this new school that was going to be starting with project-based learning, with the uh, international baccalaureate as part of the curriculum, I knew I wanted to be a part of it. So I went to a few of the parent meetings and helped, you know, minimally just writing a letter to say, hey, let's, let's have this choice available in our valley. And then uh, eventually my kids did start at SCVI uh, toward the beginning. It wasn't quite the first year. They started the second year um, at SCVI and were there for many, 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 many years. So it was a long process. And then I ended up volunteering, of course, uh, as a really involved parent and volunteering in the classrooms. And I just was really inspired by what they were seeing uh, after 
you know, like you said, being a fourth generation educator and hearing about all these great things, I wasn't didn't have my credential yet, but seeing all the, the inspiring things happening in the classroom and all the wonderful things I'd heard about from my mom who's a teacher and my family and it just I wanted to be a part of that. So I went back to school and got my credentials just because I wanted to impact kids in that same way that my kids were being impacted and I just being at that interface with kids at that moment where they're discovering their potential is just something I really enjoy and have now expanded from little kids to youth to adults and it's just a wonderful wonderful place to be yeah absolutely now Ali you mentioned um talking about what what you do you you facilitate you 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 drop that word and and I want to point that out because that's a it's an important word in our, our school organization. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, I referred earlier to you guys as teachers, but on campus, you guys aren't referred to as teachers. You're referred to as, as facilitators. Uh, as I mentioned, that, that doesn't mean that you have any uh, different or, or, or less qualifications. You guys are still highly qualified as delineated by the state of California. You guys have got your credentials and, uh, and, and fully authorized to, to do the amazing things you do in class, but you don't teach you you facilitate because we we really put the education in the kids hands ali can you talk about that for just a second what does that look like in the classroom how do you see uh, the job of facilitating class versus teaching class what's that like ali well uh for me and i know that for deja it's a more of a guide you know we we provide the materials that really we're there to guide the learning and learn with our kids um you know they really guide our discussions and we have discussions we don't have lectures we don't um do traditional lesson plans they still get the same education but we're learning with them and they really are guiding how we go through that material and i think that's really what facilitating means to me is that if the kids have questions we stop and we answer those questions and we have we might get sidelines on a whole different discussion because that's where the kids need to go with that particular topic and we're able to really meet every kid where they are needing to be met uh, through this process so instead of going in with um, like a traditional lesson plan and just staying on on that lesson plan and talking to the kids we're talking with the kids and um, they are really allowed to have a voice and choice in how we are doing the um the the teaching and it's it's a beautiful thing because they teach us every day as well right and and when you put the kids in the driver's seat like that uh first of all they're they're much more in tune and engaged in their education and, and they take things a lot a, a lot deeper it, it becomes more meaningful I, I remember growing up in in school and and if anybody ever asked me you know why i was learning a certain thing the answer was because my teacher told me to um but when you put the education in the kids hands like you guys do and you truly facilitate it, it becomes much more interesting to the kids as they're able to take it like you said in the direction uh that they want to take it so Deja, you, you mentioned that you were kind of part of that uh, that grassroots effort of of launching SCVI and the iLead organization, and and you were also instrumental in in replicating that iLead mission and vision at iLead Agua Dulce, uh, heading over to uh, to that campus here on the east side of town um, in in just their second year, uh, a couple years back. But what is that? What does that mean? I mean. So many of our, of our guests from iLead schools talk about how iLead's mission and vision uh, is so unique. But for those who are listening who might not be as familiar with it, how would you describe iLead schools' mission and vision? Well, the, the mission is a uh, – it's, it's brief, but it's powerful. So it's free to think, inspired to lead. And that that holds a lot of a lot of empowerment, and uh, it stands for a lot of big ideas with very few words. And one of the things that I have loved about being at multiple campuses is that, you know, at SCVI, SCVI does have its own culture. And when we when we were uh, having other I lead schools join our family, each each of the schools has their own culture. But we all come together around learners 
and ensuring that they are free to think and inspired to lead. And one of the things that I love about that is that in a school that values leadership, uh, like I lead schools, what it means is that all the kids have the opportunity to lead. It's not just the kids who run for ASB or happen to be the loudest in the room Mm. or happen to have that, you know, natural tendency to go there. What we do is we create small opportunities for kids who might not feel comfortable being a leader and give them those small opportunities and kind of awaken that leader within them for them to grow as leaders. And it's a really, um, it's a beautiful process to see when we have kids that, whether they come in with natural leadership skills that we hone and give them opportunities or whether they come in really shy and not really sure about what leading is and give them those opportunities and watch them blossom into leaders uh, in their own way. It's, it's amazing. And the, how we do that, how we, how we all commit at all I lead schools, even if they're different um, in each location is that, we go to the vision of the school, which is to use project-based learning Mm -hmm. and social emotional learning to really inspire them. Um, Because as facilitators, we're lifelong learners. We want to inspire our, our kids to be lifelong learners. And it's been really incredible to see at Eileen Aguadose how it has its own unique culture that just really fits with the community that it's in. Yeah, you hit it spot on, um, and it is interesting. We noticed that when we first started replicating, when we uh, decided to open an iLead campus, our second campus in Lancaster, it wasn't as simple as rolling uh, SCVI uh, up into Lancaster because you can't do that. That's not Santa Clarita. And, and we decided early on that when we open a new campus, we don't just want to be a reflection of the community we're opening in. We want to be an actual participant and an important member of that community. And, and, and so you're right. There are some, some foundational things that, that hold true for each and every one of our campuses. But then each campus does have its own unique culture. So, uh, Deja, you've, uh, you've traveled the world and, and you've lived in, in a bunch of different places and, uh, and you've gotten to know actually quite a few of uh, uh, most of our, our iLead schools and, and campuses. How would you describe the culture at iLead Agua Dulce? What's, uh, what's unique about the Agua Dulce campus and, uh, and culture? Well, it's very close-knit I would say and that is the thing that stands out the most. Um, the the community of Acton and Algood will say are very close knit community, and the with with those families who are live in that community who are at the school, and then the other families that join us from outside the community. That strong sense of community is really really felt on campus. We, as facilitators of middle school, we know kindergartners, we know first graders, we know families and parents that are in all the different grade levels. Uh, And the kids know each other and everybody on campus knows each other. It feels like a family uh, in a lot of ways. It really, it it does. And we also, (laughs) one of my favorite things about the Agadolce campus is just when you walk on campus, you, it feels different because all the kids are just playing. <laughs> they're running, they're climbing trees, they're, uh, you know, on rainy days, they, they, if they've brought their extra set of clothes, they're allowed to go play in the mud <laughs> and be kids. And it just feels kind of like that wholesome throwback to what childhood is, is all about, about exploring and being outside and moving around. And even our middle schoolers play. It's just, it's just wonderful. There's so much to it. We just value that outside because being in a rural community, a lot of our kids, they might get up at five in the morning, feed all the horses and take care of the animals. Then they come to school and they're learning and uh, the outdoors is really a big part of their lives. Absolutely. And, you know, I lead tours of our schools back when we're, you know, not safer at home and pretty much everybody says the same word when they first walk onto our campus and that's Wow, it really is an exciting campus. We're talking this morning with Deja Munn and Ali Benedetti. They are the middle school team, the 7th and 8th grade teaching team at Ilead Agua Dulce. 
When we come back, I want to talk to them about what middle school looks like at Eilid Agua Dulce because we are a transitional kinder so far through eighth grade uh, school, and, and, and they're doing some really exciting things up, uh, up here on the, on the east side of the valley. Uh, but we've got to take a, a short commercial break. We will be right back, and we'll talk a little bit more about it when we come back. You're listening to SCBI and Eilid Schools Eye on the Valley. I'm Matt Watson on your hometown station, KHTS. Accidents happen, but rest assured Patterson's Collision Center is here to help. Patterson's is a family-owned and operated collision repair facility providing the Santa Clarita Valley with premium collision repairs. Patterson's prides itself on being the only California-certified green repair shop in all of Santa Clarita. They are insurance claim specialists and even offer payment plans for your deductible. For personalized, friendly service, visit PattersonsCollisionCenter.com or call 294-1011 and let Patterson's Collision Center help ease your worries today. Why did Mercedes-Benz of Valencia win the Dealer of Excellence Award in 2019? Because we strive to provide the most outstanding sales experience. Mercedes-Benz of Valencia COO Chris Paz. We know you have high expectations. Our stellar team will meet and exceed your expectations. That's why we were named Mercedes Best of the Best, placing us in the top 10% of all Mercedes dealers nationwide. Find out how you can lease a new Mercedes for unbelievably low monthly payments. Details at mbzvalencia.com. Marla Ferris at Augusta Financial is the consummate mortgage professional committed to helping you turn your dream of home ownership into reality. With more than 22 years in the finance mortgage industry, Marla brings extensive experience and top knowledge to help make your loan experience hassle-free. Given her honesty, integrity, and attention to detail, she is the loan officer you can trust. Marla knows what it takes to get you the best loan, the best rate, and the best service in the industry. You'll find Marla Ferris at Marla F E. R-R-I-S dot com. These days, it's hard to figure out how to fill all the self-isolation time, let alone figure out what to have for lunch or dinner. Salt Creek Grill owner Greg Amsler is helping us out in a big, big way. Salt Creek is now offering takeout and curbside pickup, so you don't even have to get out of your car. Their entire menu is available for pickup or delivery, including to-go beer and wine. Hey. In addition, Greg's offering wine at 25% off along with daily specials. If you'd like to buy a gift card for a future visit, now's the time. Buy a $50 gift card and get 10 extra dollars on the card completely free. Buy a $100 gift card, you get an extra 25 bucks. Salt Creek Grill, located next to Regal Cinema at the Valencia Mall. For more info, go to saltcreekgrill.com. No words can describe the power of belonging to a group of close friends or being part of a family. Insight Treatment Center was founded more than 20 years ago to give teenagers a community of friends and family as they overcome issues like depression, anxiety, and trauma. The new Santa Clarita location is a COVID-secure environment where distance and good airflow are a priority. As a leader in providing intensive outpatient treatment to teenagers, Insight Treatment Center in Santa Clarita is here to help. Call 888-295-9995 or go online to insighttreatment.com. At College of the Canyons, we are an inclusive community, a family, a, family. a partner, a leader, a way forward, an, an open, open door. door, an affordable education, an opportunity for a different tomorrow. Spring classes begin in February. The time is now. The place is here. Enroll now. Canyons.edu slash schedule. Hometown station. KHTS is the only station I listen to. 98.1 FM and AM 1220. Welcome back. You're listening to KHTS, your hometown station, 98.1 FM and 1220 AM. This is SCVI and I lead school's Eye on the Valley. I am Matt Watson. We're joined this morning by Deja Munn and Ali Benedetti. They are the middle school team at I lead Agua Dulce. And I want to talk about that notion, the, the middle school team. Um, first of all, it's, it's awesome that the, the middle school is so small that there's just a, a team of two that's teaching the seventh and eighth grade. But Deja, Ali, um, I taught middle school myself for about uh, six years. The first four years, um, we had, gosh, probably 18 to 22 different teams, and that was a team of, of five teachers on, on each team. And 
we called them teams, but there were weeks that I would go the entire week without even really seeing or interacting with anybody else, any of the other teachers on my team, except for that 45 minutes of planning time that, uh, that we had on Thursday afternoons. Um, but you, that, that's not what we're talking about when you guys, uh, uh, when we refer to you guys as a team. You guys team teach, and, and, and it's not just, okay, Ali, you handle the humanities. Deja, you handle the math and science. Um, you guys truly do develop things as a team and work together as a team. Can you guys talk about that a little bit? How, what does uh, uh, the team teaching model mean to you guys and how does it work? How does it roll out to a real time there at Ailey Dagua Dulce? Well, I know, I know for us in particular, uh, we, from the moment we first met, we sort of are uh, one half of a whole brain, each of us. We both, <laughs> both together, we are like the same brain. Um, and, uh, I think that's because we have the same philosophy and we interact with learners in the same way and we respect learners. And, um, so we got really lucky in that aspect just on, you know, for our personalities. But the thing is that, um, you know, I've been on a lot of teams with Eileen and we do, Ali and I do the things that, that all the teams do with Eileen. We are able to uh collaborate on creating projects that we feel are a good fit for our learners and of interest to our learners and even though one of us may take a the the lead quote unquote on a particular project of you know the planning and all of that we support each other um 24 7 basically <laughs> <laughs> you know we'll get ideas at night and text each other about ideas that we have or some way that we can um, have a topic we want to discuss with our learners in advisory uh, that we think that they need to talk about or something that we think is interesting to them. So, so yes, even though we have our subjects, we talk about our projects together constantly and how we can integrate the most uh, different, more of the different types of subjects and um, things that our kids need into each project. And that takes it takes more than one person. I think that old saying of uh, two heads are better than one mm. is uh, is something that we value and why we collaborate because we bounce ideas off each other and get better ideas than we would ever get just sitting by ourselves in a room planning. Yeah, that concept of synergy. And I've seen the two of you in action. Uh, you really do make each other better. And, and that leads to uh, not only a more exciting, but a much more rigorous curriculum for our kids. But it's it's not just about the academics, the, the way you guys work as a team, is it, Allie? Uh, you know, one of our... our our heavy focuses at iLead schools, as you mentioned before, is the social emotional learning. How do you and Deja work together as a team when it comes to, um, you know, making sure that your kids are, are doing well, they're growing and not only learning, but becoming happy and, and, and healthy learners. What is that role as a, as a team teacher? How do you guys collaborate kind of for the benefit socially and emotionally for your learners? Um, well, we, we plan really, you know, SEL-focused advisories for our kids. And they, um, we like to, our kids to start the year off, like the first couple of weeks where we have advisory all together when we're on campus or distance learning. We're either in the same Zoom room or we're in the same classroom or we're outside doing the advisories together as we relearn those habits and the character lab traits. And we really put have them put what they are into definitions and images and what they mean to them so that they understand the terminology so that they're able to really um, speak about their needs and what they want to focus on. But we also love to start, we start our week all together in advisory. You know, our community is really strong in the middle school. It isn't seventh and eighth grade. It is a middle school. You know, it's not her advisory, my advisory. It is a middle school. You know, they understand where their advisories are and what their grades are, but they also understand that they are a, a middle school together, which I think is such a beautiful thing. So we start our week and we end our week together so that we can start strong 
and strong. Um, and whenever we start a new semester or we come back from a break, we like to have that first week where they're all together to rebuild those connections. And we talk all the time. You know, if we're, we see a learner that may need something um, where we're seeing it in one class, we talk to each other and we're like, okay, let's focus on this or let's, let's talk to them together or let's figure out what we can do. Um, but we've also started, you know, a, a social night for them, a virtual social night where they can just be themselves and have fun. And it was such a beautiful experience in December that we are continuing it for every last Friday of the month where they come in at like, I think it was 630 or six and then they stay for a couple of hours and they get to go in different rooms and play different games with each other and just be kids because they don't have a lot of opportunity to make that connection with um with them during the day because we're busy learning ali that is that is so beautiful um so cool especially in the pandemic we know how tough it is for kids and i know there's there's tons of parents out there listening right now just shaking their heads because they know too how how hard it's been their kids haven't been on campus they haven't seen their friends in in some cases in 10 months and here you guys are are, are setting time for for your middle schoolers to hang out together once a month on a friday night that is that is so cool and building that sense of community isn't just a, a nice thing during a pandemic. It's not just something to, to help our kids get by during these difficult times. That's something that's hugely important for the leadership and development for, for our kids. Because when we think about the most successful people in life, it is those people that think beyond themselves and, and think and act as that larger community and, and, and think not how can I succeed, but how can we succeed? Now, one of the groups of people or, or the type of person that I really um, uh, felt bad for this year is is that teacher that inherited a new group of kids and uh, has gone now six months teaching a group of students or learners without ever having met them, right, other than, than, than on Zoom. But you guys had a unique opportunity this year to to loop with your learners, right? You guys moved up from the sixth and seventh grade team last year to now the seventh and eighth grade team. So this is a group of kids that that you guys have spent time in the classroom with and, and, and developed those relationships. What was that like uh, looping with your learners and, and uh, what benefits are you seeing, especially now as, uh, as this pandemic drags on? Well, for me, it's one of my favorite things about uh, being a facilitator at ILEAD is that we do get more often more than one year with kids. Um, you know, I was uh, lucky enough to be uh, teaching second and third grade and fourth and fifth grade where I got to loop with my kids. And now um, what that did for us for middle school was, I think, even more powerful. And especially because it was in a pandemic, because we're all coming back together on Zoom. We knew the kids really well already. We were able to hit the ground running in a different way. You know, what back in March when we on a Friday knew that. Uh, we needed to go to distance learning. We hit the ground running right away with our kids. They were able to handle it. We knew them so well. And then coming back to school in the fall, we were able to start off. We already knew who they were. And we also honor how they grow, even in that, mm. in that summertime. And so we were able to really, I think we are able to take them farther and know and grow with them as well we also had new learners join us and ali and i talk all the time about how wonderful and proud we are about middle school you know middle school can be that time where people fall into cliques and you know go into these little groups and don't really include everybody and our new learners even through distance learning have been included and just thrown into our community and we feel like they have always been with us. It's, in, it's so interesting. Sometimes I have to go, Oh wait, he just joined us this year. I feel like I've known him forever. So uh, it's, it's been wonderful. And I feel like, you know, that's the community side of looping and the social emotional side, but I feel like academically, because we know, we know we can push certain kids already a little harder. We know that some kids need a different approach to be and different motivation to be able to learn on their own. And that uh, but 
Go ahead. Yeah, I just feel really lucky to, that we were able to loop with our kids. Yeah, absolutely. That relationship that you're describing is is so important in teaching and learning. You know, when uh, when you have the trust of your learners, um, you know, when they they trust you and they know that even if they don't fully understand where you're taking them, uh, they'll follow you. That that can be so powerful, and and it gets a lot of the other stuff out of the way and really gets you guys down to the the meat and potatoes of learning. We're talking this morning with Deja Mon and Ali Benedetti. They're the seventh and eighth grade team, the middle school team at I Lead Agua Dulce here on the, the east side of the valley. Their school was actually involved in a very important vote last night. And when we come back, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that as well as some of the exciting, engaging projects that they are developing to help their kids stay dialed in and excited about learning during this pandemic. So stick around. You're not going to want to miss it. I'm Matt Watson, and this is SCVI and I Lead Schools Eye on the Valley. We've got a lot more when we come back on your hometown station, KHTS. Traffic brought to you by Reeves Automotive and the CHP, who remind automobile drivers that motorcyclists can be hidden in your car's blind spot. Always take a second look when changing lanes or turning at intersections. Your following distance should always be at least four seconds. Why did Mercedes-Benz of Valencia win the Dealer of Excellence Award in 2019? Because we strive to provide the most outstanding sales experience. Mercedes-Benz of Valencia COO, Chris Paz. We know you have high expectations. Our stellar team will meet and exceed your expectations. That's why we were named Mercedes Best of the Best, placing us in the top 10% of all Mercedes dealers nationwide. Find out how you can lease a new Mercedes for unbelievably low monthly payments. Details at mbzvalencia.com. Excellence isn't just a word, it is what we deliver. Vanguard Protection Group is committed to providing its clients with the highest echelon of protective services available. Our clients not only receive the security services they contract for, but also reports that are well-written, articulate, and thorough. Our patrol officers operate at the highest levels and have an impressive rapport with local law enforcement. With military, police, private policing, and courtroom experience, you can trust that we have the strength to deliver our promise of excellence. Contact Vanguard Protection by calling 661-753-3611 or visiting their website at vanguardprotectiongroup.com. Hello, I'm Mike Glendale, inventor of MyPillow. For a limited time, you can get a queen-size premium MyPillow for the lowest price ever. Regularly $69.98, now only $29.98. MyPillow is patented and adjusts to any sleep position. It's washable and dryable, comes with a 10-year warranty, and 100% made in the USA. I'm also giving you deep discounts on all my MyPillow products, including my bed sheets, mattress toppers, and bath towels. That's $29.98 for a queen-size premium MyPillow and deep discounts on all my MyPillow products. Not only are you getting the lowest prices ever, but they're going to make the best Christmas gifts ever. Buy now and I'll extend my 60-day money-back guarantee to March 1st, 2021. Go to MyPillow.com and use the promo code KHTS or call 800-973-3927 and use the promo code KHTS. That's 800-973-3927 or go to MyPillow.com and use the promo code KHTS. Dot and plumbing, it's Eric. Son, it's mother. I wanted you to know that your drain clearings is a big hit over at the Senior Singles Club, especially on poker night when someone makes a royal flush. Well, we are the plumbers you'd send to your mom's house, and I'll bet there's a lot of moms in your retirement community. And I'm always telling them, call my son at Dot and Plumbing. Hold it. Why are you yelling? They're so hard of hearing. I just wish you could help my neighbor Eunice. She she has pills to help her Shih Tzu. Please tell me this is about a dog. Of course. Her dog has stomach trouble, so she takes pills, and that's when it happened. A backup? Let's just say <laughs> there was Shih Tzu everywhere. Oh, Mom. Duttonplumbing.com. Get Dutton Plumbing's 73-buck drain clearing. It flows or it's free with a money-back guarantee. Details at DuttonPlumbing.com. Duttonplumbing. License number 1058213. Some restrictions apply. Your hometown station, KHTS. Welcome back. You're listening to KHTS, your hometown station. 98.1 FM and 1220 on the AM side. I am Matt Watson, and you are listening to SCVI and I Lead Schools Eye on the Valley. 
We are talking this morning with Deja Mun and Ali Benedetti, the middle school teaching team at Ailid Agua Dulce. They teach 7th and 8th grade. And I mentioned before the break that their school, Ailid Agua Dulce, was, was involved in a very important vote last night. Um, and if you're not as familiar with uh, charter schools and how charter schools work, um, uh, their school ha has to actually get um, re-approved or reauthorized every it can be every two to five years and, and legislation is is always in, in constant flux so uh, what happens is for a charter school to open up they need to be authorized or sponsored by uh, the local school district that they're in and so I lead Agua Dulce is authorized by the Acton Agua Dulce school district but then run governed by and run by I lead schools so they're authorized by the local school district but but they function as a completely independent school and uh, they have a, a little bit more freedom and autonomy than, than the typical district school does, and, and that's why they're able to do the, the amazing and, and fun and exciting things that, uh, that Deja and Ali are, are describing. We'll get into some of those projects in just a minute. Ailid Agua Dulce, anyways, was, was approved by the Acton Agua Dulce School Board three years ago because of the district's own, as well as another charter school organization's, inability to support a strong school at the location that they're at there in, in, in Agua Dulce. And, and, and what the district does is then once they approve the school, then they uh, ensure the accountability and, and oversight. It's the district's job to make sure that the school is is doing all right and, and that learning is continuing to happen and, and the schools stay fiscally sound and, and things like that. And so uh, we were authorized in 2018, I say we, Ailey Dagua Dulce was authorized in 2018 as a project-based learning school, which multiple board members last night at their board meeting, their, their monthly board meeting, referred to as they were voting on, now after three years, whether or not to reauthorize the school. Because what can happen if, if the school board doesn't think the school's doing a good enough job, they can choose to not reauthorize the school and, and the school will shut down. It's one of those kind of stressful things in the charter world that you're constantly uh, uh, worried about, but it helps keep the schools accountable and making sure that they're staying successful. Well, last night, the Acton Agua Dulce School Board voted to reauthorize the school for another five-year term. And, and so, Deja and Ali, congratulations to you guys and the rest of the I Lead Agua Dulce uh, community for, uh, for that last night. And so we're excited about the next five years and, and what that holds for our school. I mentioned that we're a project-based learning school. Deja, Ali, um, what are some of your favorite projects? Because rather than just going through the chapters of a book, you guys roll out your curriculum through these projects that are intended to engage your kids, get them excited about their learning, and, and make their learning real. So what are some of the fav your favorite projects that you guys have developed for and, and rolled out for your kids? Oh, we have so many that we love, uh, but we do have a couple favorites. Um, and the we've done great projects on campus before distance learning. We've done great projects through distance learning. Um, it's been uh, a wonderful to be able to continue that. So one of my favorites um, and the, that the kids talk about a lot and the families talk about a lot is basically a, it's a financial literacy project. And we had a driving question because in, in project-based learning, we have a driving question that um, helps, you know, drive the process of, of the learning. And it was, how do I adapt my budget to make financial decisions based on life events? So our kids were able to learn a lot about math, a lot about financial literacy. They had to write a ton about it. They went through the process of taking uh, case studies of people and looking at, okay, well, how would this, what loan should this person take? How do you know what a good loan is? How do you know what the different types of interest are? And what implications that has? How do you choose what type of car loan to get? How do you choose what kind of mortgage to get? That what fits your budget and what fits your family? And then they had some other scenarios where they were uh, working at, okay, well, you have a certain amount of budget. And here's your job that you get. So that was putting the kids in the driver's seat. They, they got jobs and then a salary, and they had to figure out, well, can I afford that cell phone plan or can I not? And they had to do a detailed budget. And that was all preparing them, and they were doing research along the way throughout the whole process as well. 
what they eventually did was they were able to become financial advisors to their families. So they, they took a look at their own family's budget, they analyzed the budgets, and they met with their families to give them financial advice. Um, we had actually a, a, a wonderful community speaker um, who you know very well uh, came in. <laughs> Mrs. Elizabeth Hopp came in and talked to our kids about the real world implications of different types of loans and and how important it is to be financially literate. And a lot of our kids were so grateful and families were so grateful that they got to learn about finances at a young age and they're going to be, they're already feeling more prepared for a lot of things that they're going to need to have in their life and was a very rigorous academic project. Uh, and also uh, we had a lot of social emotional learning happening in there too. They had to begin with the end in mind with their budget. They had to be proactive. Um, so that was one of my favorites. You know, and it just, it reminds me, um, you know, there's a lot of questioning that goes on in our classrooms, but one of the questions that I don't think I've ever heard in my 10 years with ILEAD schools is, why are we learning this? That why behind our learning is always uh, so obvious as, as the kids are learning uh, those state standards that they need to learn, but they're learning them through uh, very authentic and, and, and real projects. And, and they're also learning those very real leadership skills as, as we talked about. Ali, we're, we're a seven habits organization and, and we focus on uh, Stephen Covey's seven habits of highly effective people, but boy, did you guys wrap, ratchet it up this year and, and, and you guys are looking at habit number eight and habit number eight of seven habits. Well, Stephen Covey identified uh, an eighth habit. Ali, what are you guys working on? What are you guys focusing on this year as habit eight? So our whole year is basically focused around find your voice and use your voice. So mm. it's not just finding your voice and being that leader, but using that voice. And there are different outlets for that that they can do. Um, so we're trying to give them the opportunities to take that role and own how they feel and own what they want to do and, and let it be heard. Um, and one of the ways that we did this was through one of our distance learning projects, which was called Broken Laws, and it was based um, around the Constitution Project. Mm -hmm. And their driving question for this one was, how can we change the law to make our society better for everyone? Mm -hmm. So it wasn't just looking at what would benefit me, but it's what benefits all. And they had to research different laws um, and find either a new law that they wanted to propose or amend a current law, or even amend a bill that was in process of being voted on. And they did research, they wrote argumentative essays, and then they presented these proposed laws and arguments through a live podcast. That is really cool, and it really does help them find their uh, their voice. Uh, Deja Mon, Ali Benedetti, the 7th and 8th grade facilitators at Ailee Dagua Dulce. If you're interested in enrolling your child in transitional kindergarten through 8th grade, you can contact us at ileadaguadulce.org. Ladies, thank you for joining us this morning. You have a great weekend. And you, don't go away. When we come back, we'll be talking to Dr. Tracy Lawrence, Medical Director of the Emergency Department at Henry Mayo. Stay tuned. I'm Matt Watson, and you're listening to SCVI and ILEAD Schools, Eye on the Valley on your hometown station, KHTS. Consumers Furniture is back open for your business. The safety of our community and our staff, above all, is most important to us. We will provide a safe and clean environment for you to find the perfect piece of furniture for your home. To help you with your purchase, we are offering 25% off your entire order or 24 months same as cash financing. And for our awesome essential workers, we will deliver locally your furniture free of charge. Consumers Furniture is located in the Centerpoint Shopping Center below Sam's Club and Walmart. Welcome to Duncan. There are two Duncan locations in the SCV. Both locations have outdoor seating, carry out service, and delivery with Postmates, Grubhub, and Uber Eats. Use the Duncan app to order and accumulate points. The Canyon Country location on Sierra Highway near Via Princesa has drive through service and is open till 7 p.m. The Bouquet Canyon location just off Newhall Ranch Road has curbside service and is now open till 7 p.m. The Santa Clarita Valley runs on Duncan. KHTS AM 1220 and 98.1 FM Santa Clarita. It's 9 o'clock. Time for national news on KHTS. 
The president's exit plan. I'm Lisa Brady, Fox News. President Trump is reportedly planning to leave Washington on the morning of Inauguration Day, holding a farewell event at Joint Base Andrews, though a source tells Reuters he considered leaving a day early. It's still not clear whether he'll face, when he'll face trial in the Senate. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi hasn't sent over the article of impeachment passed by the House. Now it's possible a trial could begin within hours of President-elect Biden being sworn in next week. Pelosi has insisted President Trump's removal is an immediate priority and one that really cannot wait. There was speculation early on that the House would delay sending over the article for a few weeks. That no longer appears to be the case. The Senate, though, already has so much on its plate, including numerous nominations by the president-elect. Plus, there's going to be that pressure to pass additional economic stimulus relief. Fox's Mark Meredith in D.C. The president-elect laying out a nearly $2 trillion plan to speed up vaccinations and offer economic relief, including another round of larger stimulus checks. A disappointing December offering more evidence of the economy's pandemic pain. Retail sales sinking by seven-tenths of a percent instead of the slight Stations, growth this is economists Radio were expecting for the end of the holiday season. Channel shortly right now, the Dow is down 150 where points. The, mayor, the National will give an Mall in D.C. is on the city's preparations to for the, the general inauguration public as well as until other after topics inauguration that is coming up once again shortly on your unanchored channel. As Fox dozens Radio of New arrests York. continue over last week's Capitol attack. Eric Munchell. Authorities say he brought zip ties, which can be used as hand restraints, into the Capitol building. And there's John Sullivan. Law enforcement said he was seen outside the Capitol building using a microphone as he told the crowd they were about to burn it down. There's Peter Francis Steger. He was arrested in Arkansas. Authorities say he hit a police officer with an American flag. Fox's Rich Edson, the New York Times reporting over three dozen people are under investigation for the death of Capitol officer Brian Sicknick. America is listening to Fox News. I hired nuptial num nums to cater my wedding, and it was a disaster. Everyone was raving about the food instead of my dress. No matter how hard you work for your small business, online reviewers will find something to complain about. They're like, oh, Veronica, the lamb chops. Ah, uh, did the lamb chops fly you out to Cancun? And while Progressive can't save you from these trolls, we can help you save money on commercial auto and business insurance. I will not be hiring them for my next wedding. Get a quote online today at ProgressiveCommercial.com. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company, affiliated and third-party insurers. News Max TV is the biggest thing on cable news, with shows including Dick Morris, Rudy Giuliani, Michelle Malkin, Diamond and Silk, Mike Huckabee, and more. Every night, watch Newsmax's number one show, Greg Kelly Reports. Greg Kelly tells you the big stories you won't hear anywhere else. Newsmax is on all major cable systems. Check your guide or tell your operator you want Newsmax. 30 million Americans watch Newsmax TV. And download the Newsmax app on your smartphone. It's free, so get Newsmax TV anytime, anywhere. State capitals have been stepping up security, too, ahead of next week's inauguration. Utah Governor Republican Spencer Cox declaring a state of emergency due to possible violent protests over the weekend and following the lead of other governors to close Utah's state capital. In the wake of protests last week at the U.S. Capitol, for which a left-wing activist from Provo, Utah, becomes one of the latest to be arrested Thursday. An FBI bulletin has warned of more protests planned for all 50 state capitals. Though unlike governors, in states like Minnesota and Ohio, Governor Cox not sending Utah National Guard members to Washington, D.C., instead keeping them in the state should they be needed there. Jeff Manasso, Fox News. U.S. troop levels are down to historic lows in Iraq and Afghanistan. Acting Defense Secretary Christopher Miller said in a statement the U.S. military has reduced the number of troops in Iraq and Afghanistan to 2,500 in each country. Friday marked the deadline announced by Miller in November on the orders of President Trump. Last year, four U.S. troops were killed in combat in Afghanistan and an equal number in Iraq. There are now 7,000 National Guard troops guarding the nation's capital, more forces than currently deployed to Iraq and Afghanistan combined. Up to 21,000 National Guardsmen are expected to be mobilized in D.C. by Inauguration Day. Fox's Lucas Tomlinson at the Pentagon. There have been some questions about whether the drawdown in Iraq and Afghanistan could continue after Congress over road President Trump's veto of a defense authorization bill that required a review. The U.S. Treasury Department just announcing more sanctions, some targeting Cuba and others part of a last-ditch effort to keep up the pressure on China over human rights abuses, this time related to Hong Kong's autonomy, the sanctions targeting police officers there and a pro-Beijing politician. I'm Lisa Brady, and this is Fox News.
I'm Stuart Varney, and this is the Fox Business Report. We're seeing some selling on Wall Street the morning after President-elect Biden released his $1.9 trillion stimulus proposal. And it's also the morning we're seeing a worse-than-expected retail sales report. Sales dropped for a third straight month, down seven-tenths of a percent in December, as shoppers kept away from stores as COVID cases continue to rise. Now, one company, which sold more compared to a year earlier, Signet, which owns K and Zales Jewelers. Preliminary holiday results, online sales up 60%. Why? Because we bought online, picked up in store, same store sales rose 5.6%. Fox's Lauren Simonetti and Walmart's chief executive officer of U.S. e-commerce, Mark Lohr, is stepping down at the end of the month. That's your Fox Business Report. I'm Lillian Wu, invested in you. Newsmax TV is the biggest thing on cable news, with shows including Dick Morris, Rudy Giuliani, Michelle Malkin, Diamond and Silk, Mike Huckabee, and more. Every night, watch Newsmax's number one show, Greg Kelly Reports. Greg Kelly tells you the big stories you won't hear anywhere else. Newsmax is on all major cable systems. Check your guide or tell your operator you want Newsmax. 30 million Americans watch Newsmax TV. And download the Newsmax app on your smartphone. It's free, so get Newsmax TV anytime, anywhere. Thanks for listening to KHTS AM 1220, Canyon Country, California, K260CO 98.1 FM, Santa Clarita, California. Santa Clarita Valley residents now have greater access to the excellent physicians and high quality medical services for which Providence Holy Cross is known. Providence Holy Cross Health Center in Santa Clarita features state-of-the-art cancer and imaging technologies, as well as board-certified physicians in a variety of medical specialties. Quality and compassion from a health care provider you can depend on. For more information, call 1-888-HEALING or visit us at Providence.org. No contract pest control. Did you hear that? Yes, Unipest has no contract, low-impact, affordable, and environmentally and family-friendly pest control options with orange oil, or other family-friendly products. Whether it's ants, spiders, gophers, termites, or bed bugs, Unipest Termite and Pest Control has an effective, eco-friendly option for you. Call Unipest today for a free orange oil inspection at 661-BUG-7575 or visit unipest.com. Hey there, it's Story with your hometown station weather. Beautiful day this afternoon, sunny skies, but windy with a wind advisory in effect for today and tomorrow. Highs in the mid-80s, overnight lows in the 50s, more of the same tomorrow. For anything and everything Santa Clarita Valley related, go to hometownstation.com. 98.1 FM and AM 1220. The following is sponsored programming and does not necessarily reflect the views or opinions of KHTS or its ownership. Welcome back. You're listening to KHTS, your hometown station, 98.1 FM and 1220 AM. I am Matt Watson, your host. You're listening to SCVI and I Lead School's Eye on the Valley, where we are celebrating National Hat Day today. And yeah, you know, you may say, oh, Matt, you're just looking for an excuse to celebrate. But you know what? These times that we're living in, uh, boy, we, we, uh, we could use a reason to celebrate. So if it's the opportunity to go even a little bit more casual on a Friday and rock that hat, then you better believe I'm going to do it. My next guest, Dr. Bud Lawrence, is the Director of Emergency Services at Henry Mayo Newhall Memorial Hospital. Dr. Lawrence is a graduate of UCLA and attended Keck USC School of Medicine. He began his career at Henry Mayo in 2003 as an attending emergency uh, medicine physician. Uh, Dr. Lawrence was very involved in many emergency department quality-related projects early on and was quickly appointed to the emergency department director of risk management. Currently the director of the emergency department, Dr. Lawrence is also the owner of the Henry Mayo Urgent Care Center. Dr. Lawrence, welcome back to the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's my pleasure. Uh, Dr. Lawrence, it's uh, we're, we're so so glad that you could come in. I know, gosh, we were talking about it off the air. I know how busy you are and and, and your team, but uh, you know, so many in and around our community uh, are are getting our information on the state of our hospitals 
in the news. And, and as you know, the news that we watch is, is typically L.A. based, and, and we're not always certain. So does that apply to us here in Santa Clarita? Are we doing better? Are we doing worse? Is it about the same? And, and so it's good to be able to check in and, and, and get a local uh, uh like I said, check in from uh, from Henry Mayo. Before we get to that, I I, I want to get a little bit of information uh, from you for our listeners uh, about the hospital. Um, first of all, Henry Mayo is uh, considered a level two trauma center. Um, so. Uh, other than me, when I was six years old, falling off the top of a dugout over there at William S. Hart uh, uh, Little League, um, what does that mean to be a level two trauma center? That's a great question. So essentially what it means is that we, our hospital, is ready and prepared at all times to take care of trauma patients more so than uh, just a general community hospital. And this preparedness includes things like Uh, We have a trauma surgeon that is at our hospital, in the hospital, 24 hours a day, every day, 365 days a year. So if any patient walks into the emergency room or is brought in by paramedics, we have that trauma surgeon there. We have neurosurgeons available. We have all the specialties available to treat all the things that could happen to a trauma patient on call, ready to come in. Uh, So... It, it's a distinction through the county and uh, as well through the through the uh, in the United States that we are ready and prepared more so than any other hospital to the point that uh, if there were multiple hospitals in a certain area where a patient has a traumatic injury, the patient is taken preferentially by the paramedic ambulance to the trauma center because we know that we have followed these established guidelines to prove that we are going to get better outcomes for our trauma patients, uh, better results. Uh, than other hospitals that are not trauma centers. Well, gosh, that is um, that's comforting to know that uh, that we've got that level of care right here in our backyard. God forbid uh, we should need it. Although um, recently, uh, pandemic and outside of the pandemic, uh, we have needed it. So we're, we're we're grateful that you guys are there and able to provide that level of care. Now, in recent years, the, the hospital's also engaged in a capital campaign to expand the facility, haven't they? Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that, uh, that expansion? What did you guys do, and, and, and what does that enable you to do now? Yeah, we, we have, we actually still ongoing have a capital campaign uh, to help us fund our new patient tower which is, uh, it's a, a, you, if you drive by the hospital, you'll see it. Uh, it's, uh, I, believe, uh, I believe it's six floors, actually, but uh, five patient care floors um, where we are able to uh, shift our patients into private rooms. It's more comfortable. Uh, it's obviously up to date because it's brand new. Uh, and, it, and most importantly and timely right now, this tower uh, and the construction uh, of, of this building and the donations from the community within our capital campaign, which I say is still ongoing. So if, if you have the will or the wherewithal to donate, uh, it's, a, it's a great cause. This tower has saved us. Um, and I, and I, d- during COVID, I do not uh, say that lightly. Uh, us having the ability to expand a COVID unit over three floors of this tower to make sure that we have the capacity to take care of this surge of COVID, this has saved us. And, and I can say that uh, definitively because other hospitals that have had uh, a fixed amount or a fixed size of their physical plant, the size of their hospital isn't able to grow, they're putting patients out in tents in, in, in the parking lot because there's nowhere else to put patients in the hospital. We are able to put patients in private rooms where they can get the amazing care that they're receiving here at Henry Mayo. And much, if not all, that is done uh, because of this tower and the donations of our community to help this community owned hospital uh, be successful during COVID. It's really amazing. That is amazing. And you, I'm sure, know how uh, how generous and, and supportive our community has always been, not only of the hospital, but of the various uh, nonprofits in and around town. Uh, so let's not miss that opportunity if a, a listener is listening and is as grateful as I am for the hospital and, and, and is willing and able to to donate. Where can they go to uh, to make a donation to that campaign? So to donate to this campaign, you would want to find the uh, or look up the Henry Mayo 
uh, Newhall Hospital Foundation, um, and that can be you can just Google that, uh, and you can uh, you can reach out to the foundation. I'm actually I sit on our foundation board, uh, and the, it is a wonderful organization that can help facilitate. Uh, you know, any kind of donation you can you can make. And even now we have a lot of people that are donating food uh, mm. and and treats for our COVID staff to help keep them uh, nourished during these times of working crazy hours. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll get into that in, in just a little bit because, gosh, uh, my heart really goes out to you and your staff for all the uh, amazing things that you guys just continue to do as, as you run that uh, – that mega marathon, right? This isn't uh, that that trauma of a uh, of a pile up on the five that you guys have to get through twenty four to forty eight hours. You guys are now going on almost a full year of of this pandemic, uh, and, and that's just stacked on top of all of the other uh, well uh, baby deliveries and dirt bike accidents and and things like that 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 happen on a daily basis in and around our community. Um, you talked about that 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 new tower being instrumental in helping our hospital be prepared for for this surge. Um, can you can you share a little bit when we talk about preparedness? Being proactive is is so important in all walks of life. But uh, as proactive as you guys were, you guys really took some steps early, early, early on, even before our first case of COVID, to make sure that that you were prepared. And that preparedness has Gosh, I, I gotta think saved countless lives. Can can you you talk a little bit about the preparedness and what you guys did to make sure that you were prepared for the pandemic? Yeah, I absolutely can, and and I and I have said this to other people in the past as well is that the team of people that we have at Henry Mayo uh, that have worked on this COVID pandemic response is absolutely outstanding. I would go to battle with these people mm. anywhere, anytime. Uh, we, as a collective, uh, th this group of people has been able to create uh, an environment in your community hospital that serves your community uh, that is as prepared as I, I would say probably any hospital in this country. Uh, it, from the very onset, we did our best to uh, secure PPE and other resources, which really, really was the big challenge initially, because uh, you you look at uh, the the ability of uh, companies to produce things like PPE and uh, produce uh, various resources. Uh, we we went out and we we made sure that we had ample supplies of PPE. Uh, we've we've bolstered up other areas of the hospital in terms of. Uh, how how we can um, keep patients with COVID separated from patients who are non-COVID to provide a safe environment for the things that you talked about before, the bumps and bruises and babies, uh, all those things that can come into the hospital at the same time. Remember, we're still an operating hospital. So uh, really to, to create procedures and protocols to keep our patients safe, keep our staff safe, uh, I, we, that, that was a tremendous amount of work in the beginning that was done, and, uh, and the job that was done still stands strong today, uh, and we continue to do that work on a daily basis. Absolutely. You guys uh, were, were really ready. And, uh, you know, you and I talked back in June. You made um, some pretty interesting predictions back in the month of March uh, before, you know, as the rest of us were still trying to figure out what in the world was going on. And and when we talked in June, those predictions had been kind of spot on. Uh, uh, but uh, how <laughs> how are your predictions going now? Did you predict this level of surge uh, and where the hospital's currently at? And then uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll leave that there and then and then hit you with a follow up. Um, are is this kind of where you envisioned things would be uh, when when you guys were preparing? Uh, to be fair, I, I, I did feel that we were going to have a surge in the winter. That's something that has been talked about frequently prior. Uh, and to me, I think a lot of this has to do with uh, holidays and family gatherings yeah. uh, and uh, those types of things. So I did think things would be worse during these winter months. And in fact, I still think we are in a window over the next two, three, maybe four weeks uh, of seeing increasing patients because of the remainder of the holidays in the end of December. Now, uh, we, we hopefully won't see that. Again, everything with COVID is not very unpredictable. Uh, <laughs> however, uh, 
I, I do think that uh, I was I was expecting things to be rough over the winter months, perhaps not this rough. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you stop and sit back and look at what's going on, L.A. is really the uh, has been for the past few weeks, at least the epicenter of covid in the world. So uh, that that was is a bit more forceful. <laughs> Uh, of a response from COVID than I was expecting. Yeah, you, you talk about LA. You know, we keep hearing uh, the news about the lack of capacity at our uh, LA County hospitals, and you know, one of the things that that really uh, shakes somebody when they're sitting at home listening to the news is uh, this statistic that uh, we're at zero percent or. Uh, Uh, availability or 100% capacity. Uh, It it leads people to think that if I go to the hospital, there's nowhere for me, no matter how bad I am. So uh, let's let's forget about, well, let's not forget about, but uh, let's focus on our local community and, and, and try to filter out the rest of the county. What's the status of, of Henry Mayo as far as the availability of beds? If, uh, uh, God forbid, I am having COVID symptoms or test positive and I'm not doing well, I need to come in. Or, uh, like you said, I'm having another medical emergency. Is, you know, is there capacity at our local hospital? It's a great question. Uh, we do. We again, the tower has has saved us that we have all these beds that we can allocate uh, to COVID patients, and they're private rooms that we can keep patients away uh, with COVID. We can keep them separate from patients who are non-COVID. Um, we do have physical space of beds, and oftentimes, uh, again, as I said, we do not have. We're not putting patients in tents in parking lots. Uh, again. I can't predict the future. Things could get more out of control, but currently we're able to keep up with this. But really our limiting resource tends to be staff because really our our backbone of our hospital function are our nurses and techs and respiratory therapists. These these are these are the people who keep the the hospital uh, going. And, uh, you know, these these are humans and these humans are getting affected by covid just like everyone else. So um, our, really our most significant challenge at this point, as well as with everyone else nationally, is nurse staffing. Uh, but we, we have beds uh, that, that is just a challenge every day to sort through and make sure we have the staff to staff those beds. Yeah, and, and speaking of staff, um, so it, it, it can be stressful as things surge. It, you know, you're not able to, uh, like I am, if I've got a teacher that's absent, pick up the phone and call a sub and have them come in. That's a little bit more difficult for you guys. And then also, yeah, you're having staff that's uh, that's getting sick and, and, and maybe experiencing symptoms. And so they've got to stay away for, for, for quite a while. So that, that limits you as far as what you can do with physical staff. But let's talk about um, the toll that this is taking on staff. How are you and the rest of the team at Henry Mayo holding out, dealing with the stress uh, uh, and, and, and the ability to kind of keep up that energy to do what needs to be done for those that are there at, at the hospital? I think that's a wonderful question. I, I think that uh, we've been doing this now for 10, 11 months, as you say, almost a yeah. year, and it's fatiguing. It is fatiguing uh, more than usual work because we're wearing – uh, we're wearing PPE all day. Uh, it's uh, very exhausting at the end of the day. And just to be honest, we've been doing this as has the whole world for many, many months. Mm-hmm. And it, it, it definitely uh, does get a little bit fatiguing. However, uh, I, I tell people this all the time that this is probably not, not a, a generational event. This is probably a lifetime event. Uh, for me, at least when I look at how much work that I'm doing. To, I, I'm excited to do that work for our community and for the people in our community because this is a time in my life where for the rest of my life, 40 years from now, hopefully, if I'm still alive, I will look back and say, I, we, we did this thing. We worked on this thing for these people. And that, that is something I think that, that many of the, uh, the nurses and staff in our hospital and physicians feel the same. And they have all risen to this occasion to, to bring bring out their best and their strongest. And and we are uh, going out on our shields to make sure that we are delivering to this community the health care that it not only deserves, but, uh, but hopefully expects. And, and I think we're following through on that. I think the hospital has done an amazing job trying to find extra staff. 
I mean, they have looked at, they're exhausting every possible resource. And, uh, and I, 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 again, uh, this is a group of people, uh, the, the entire hospital staff and physicians, that we have attacked this in a way that I am, I am proud uh, to be part of this machine. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's just so inspiring, and and, and words can't express uh, our community's gratitude for for you and the rest of the staff at, at Henry Mayo. Everything that you guys uh, do every single day that that you guys are going in uh, and taking care of. Uh, Producer Sarah, thank you so much. She dropped the the link to the Henry Mayo Foundation. Uh, website in in the chat if you're on facebook live you can just click on that uh, and uh, and make a donation to help keep henry mayo up and running and doing the amazing things that they uh, they continue to do as, as far as that capital campaign is concerned and, and then as dr lawrence mentioned um people every day are still stopping by to to drop off uh, meals and snacks and, and and things like that uh, santa clarita we need to continue to support those that are taking such good care of us I, I want to talk to you, Dr. Lawrence, uh, about um, different things that are on everybody else's mind. You know, I want to talk about numbers. I want to talk about vaccines and 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 our community's response to uh, to this and, and and policy. We do need to take care of a little bit of business, but uh, when we get back, we'll we'll get into all those topics. We're talking this morning with Dr. Bud Lawrence, the director of the emergency department at Henry Mayo Hospital. We've got to take that quick break, but when we come back, we will have more. You're listening to SCVI and I Lead Schools. Eye on the Valley. I'm Matt Watson on your hometown station, KHTS. Uh, folks, this is your pancake speaking. If you look out your window, we're flying over IHOP's delicious international pancake combos. Sweet Trace Leches. A pancake wonderland with views of Belgian chocolate, Trace Leches, and vanilla spice. Pancakes. 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 You know, let's back this thing up and take another look. <laughs> Go on a pancation with International Pancakes at IHOP, starting at $4.99. KHTS strives to give the Santa Clarita Valley all the information they need. And when our computers aren't working the way they should, we call Resurgence, your true source for IT. Resurgence provides outstanding customer service while also providing the highest technical ability. They strive to do what's best to improve and protect your business. For more information on Resurgence, call 349-4114 or visit resurgenceit.com. Are you looking for educational flexibility and choice? Look no further than your front door. iLead Exploration's independent study program is passionate about personalized learning. Our mission is to inspire learners to become creative problem solvers, compassionate leaders, conscientious collaborators, and responsible citizens who develop a lifelong love of learning. Our families partner with a credentialed teacher to customize each child's educational path. Families access community partners to choose a variety of in-person, online, and at-home options to create an optimal learning environment for each learner. Our program also values community, and through a variety of field studies, service projects, park days, and family gatherings, we provide many opportunities to foster friendships. Because there are currently in-person limitations due to COVID, we are offering activities online through webinars and virtual field trips. iLead Exploration is a tuition-free, independent study charter school program serving grades TK through 12 in Los Angeles, Orange, Kern, San Bernardino, and Ventura counties. To learn more about our program, visit iLeadExploration.org. iLead Schools, free to think inspired to lead. Welcome to Duncan. There are two Duncan locations in the SCV. Both locations have outdoor seating, carry-out service, and delivery with Postmates, Grubhub, and Uber Eats. Use the Duncan app to order and accumulate points. The Canyon Country location on Sierra Highway near Via Princesa has drive through service and is open till 7 p.m. The Bouquet Canyon location just off Newhall Ranch Road has curbside service and is now open till 7 p.m. This Santa Clarita Valley runs on Duncan. Your hometown station. KHTS is the only station I listen to. 98.1 FM and AM 1220. Welcome back. You're listening to KHTS, your hometown station, 98.1 FM and 1220 AM. This is SCVI and I Lead Schools Eye on the Valley. I'm your host, Matt Watson, and this morning we're keeping our eye on Henry Mayo Hospital. 
checking in with Dr. Bud Lawrence, the director of the emergency department at Henry Mayo, and on the status of our hospital. And uh, gosh, every time we talk, Dr. Lawrence, I, uh, I'm just overwhelmed with how impressed I am at, uh, at the hospital's preparedness and, and response to the pandemic, as well as as, as gosh, everything that we continue to deal with on a on a daily basis. Now, Dr. Lawrence, yesterday it was reported here on your hometown station uh, that the Santa Clarita Valley has now surpassed 20,000 cumulative COVID-19 cases. Uh, what can you tell me about the numbers at the hospital? Um, how many cases uh, have you guys seen? Uh, how many uh, how many deaths have you seen? How many recoveries? Uh, what are the statistics kind of telling us about our community right now? Well, as you brought up, the numbers of COVID um, really are astonishingly high. Uh, and, and as I said before, Los Angeles really is the epicenter of COVID in the world right now. So uh, in, in terms of right now, as of today, we have 97 COVID patients in the hospital. Again, so uh, the, when I say that this tower has saved us, I mean that we were able to dedicate three full floors of our hospital tower to taking care of COVID patients in private rooms. So uh, 97 is, is a very big number. If you look back to how things were in the very beginning of COVID, when we had our initial surge, uh, that, that those times we were in the, the 40s or maybe sometimes 50 patients, uh, but, but nothing like we have seen so far. So uh, this is certainly uh, a large number of COVID patients, and which just tells you there's also a larger number of COVID patients in the community because you have to think of think of it this way, that 97 patients that's in our hospital, that are in our hospital right now, those are just the ones that are uh, really so sick that they can't really safely be discharged home. Sure. So there are many patients that we see in the emergency department or are tested elsewhere where they are COVID positive. But remember, most people who have COVID have uh, a relatively mild course of illness, much like a flu, and uh, and don't need hospitalization. So uh, to date, so far throughout this whole pandemic, we have discharged 869 people from the hospital. So even though uh, that we are seeing higher number of COVID patients now, throughout this pandemic, we've had a real steady stream of patients, and we are up to almost 900 patients that have come into the hospital and uh, we've been able to treat them appropriately and get them better, and they've gone home to recover. Uh, we have had, sadly, 96 uh, patients who have passed away from COVID. Mm. Um, every patient that passes away uh, for any reason is tragic, uh, much sure. less from this viral illness. Uh, but if you kind of run those numbers, we're, we're at just above 10% of our patients that are patients in this community that are so sick that they have to stay in the hospital, only just over 10% of those are actually passing away, which to me, uh, even though 96 is a large number, one is a large number, particularly if that's your family member. Right. But I, I, I feel that we have come to a point in this pandemic that we are understanding better how to treat these patients. Uh, we are understanding uh, how to get these patients better and how to get them home. So uh, of the sickest COVID patients in this valley who needed to be admitted, only only a little over 10% of those have passed away, which is awful, even if it's just one. However, those numbers uh, are are very, uh, very much so, I, I think, impressive uh, that we are able to get almost 900 patients discharged. I agree. And you mentioned before uh, about your... Uh your hopes uh, looking back on this 30, 40 years down the line and, and saying, yeah, I was part of the team that, that helped get our community through that. I also think about those nearly 900 patients now that, that were really, really sick and, and had to be hospitalized that were able to recover and, and go home and, and how they might look back on it and, and talk to their children, their grandchildren about, um, you know, that, that great COVID pandemic. Yeah, I was, I was in the hospital and I remember the day I got to go home. Um, so yeah, each one of those is, is a huge victory. Obviously, the uh, the the nearly 100 tragedies that you talked about, but uh, almost 900 victories of folks going home is 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 really impressive. So um, you know, it's one of those things that we don't necessarily consider on a on a on a daily basis of what's it going to be like if I have to go to the ER. We only have you know the the 10 15 minutes that we're driving to the ER to think about. 
shoot, what's it going to be like in, in the midst of a pandemic? Uh, can you describe a little bit what that experience is like for, for patients right now? If, if someone is having severe symptoms of COVID or if they uh, break a leg and need to head to the ER, what's that experience like? This is an amazing question. Thank you for asking. Uh, essentially, I'd like to preface this all with a statement that we, we've been saying for a long time, which is, if you are having something that you would have come to the emergency department pre-COVID for, uh, please come to the emergency department now. So initially, the big push was, hey, don't come to hospitals, stay away, things are crazy, particularly in New York and places like Italy. However, we were, we were having patients with heart attacks and strokes who were saying to themselves, ooh, I don't know, there's COVID at the hospital. I don't want to get COVID, so I'll stay home. And these are very time-sensitive illnesses that we can intervene and make better for many cases. But if you if you don't come in and you stay at home, by the time patients eventually did come in, time is the clock has already passed and there's not much we can do for some of these patients. So please come if you would have come anyway. That's the first thing. The next thing is when you come in, instead of walking into the hospital to be triaged, you'll be triaged outside so that we can we can tell try to tell our best from the very beginning, are you someone who's at risk for COVID or has COVID, or are you someone who is not at risk for COVID? And we can then separate those patients so that if you have to come to the emergency room for your broken leg, for example, mm -hmm. we have a place to put you that is separate from anyone who is at risk for COVID. And another thing to think about is that everyone gets given a mask if you don't have one already. So we want to make sure that everyone is wearing a mask, everyone is separated as much as they can be to make that environment in the emergency department safe for your care. So we want to make sure that whatever your issue is, whether you're having a baby or you have a, a, a staple in your finger, whatever it is, it is safe to come to the emergency department to be seen. And then when we bring patients into the emergency department, we continue that process of separation of COVID and non-COVID. And this is something that is true throughout the entire hospital. So we want to make sure that if you have, uh, if you're a non-COVID patient, that you are safe from anyone who may potentially have COVID. And uh, and for COVID patients, we want to keep you separate to not only protect other people but protect our staff, and then to identify you as a potential COVID patient, so we can give you that specialized care that we're able to offer our COVID patients in terms of. Uh, making sure your oxygen levels are fine, treating your oxygenation, getting x-rays and CAT scans and lab tests, whatever you may need, so we can provide appropriate and accurate care to our COVID patients. So, yes, it looks a little different. It feels a little different. Our wait times uh, sometimes are, are very, very low, but because of the way this sort of surges at times, it comes like it's like the tide it comes in and goes out mm. uh, there are times where the hospital is extremely busy and wait times can be extraordinary and to that point to the community if you're listening i apologize if you're there on a day where your wait time is long please try to understand that's not how it is at a baseline at henry mayo it's just the tide has has come in and it is very busy and we will still do our absolute top level best to take care of you as quickly as we can we ask for patience from our patients in the community uh, during this very, very trying time. It's trying to stress our system. Our system, we've built it to be strong to withstand the stress, but it definitely uh, can affect your patient experience, and we apologize if you happen to come on one of those days. We appreciate that, and it's certainly understandable, but but hearing what you're talking about as well as I, I've mentioned to you off the air that I've had some experience with family members uh, there at the ER recently, I if, if I have an emergency medical need, I, I'd much rather be waiting at Henry Mayo than to get right in at, an, at another hospital right now. It sounds like you guys are doing just a phenomenal job, and, and I've heard from multiple people that, that, that have been there that would say the same. Now, Dr. Lawrence, I don't want to get you in any trouble. I don't want to put you on the spot and uh, by asking you to, to comment politically on things uh, going on right now, but as far as a physician and, and the head of uh, an emergency room and trauma center, um, how do you feel that we're doing in terms of uh, uh, 
of policy and how our our state and and, and local uh, policy leaders are are handling things. Are, are we doing everything that we can? Should we be uh, locking things down further and and, and being a, a little bit stricter with uh, laws and ordinances, or are we going too far and shutting things down? How do you how do you feel that we're responding as a state and 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 as a local uh, uh, municipality? I suppose. Boy, you don't lie. That is a loaded question. Uh, <laughs> I would say, uh, I would say that's a tough question to answer, and I'm not trying to dodge it. Uh, I'll tell you why I think it's tough. I think it's tough because there are areas where the state and and, and local governments have really stepped up their game in terms of helping provide us resources, uh, even staff. We requested staff from our, our government, and they've sent us nurses and respiratory therapists. Mm -hmm. So there are, there are things that the government is doing uh, that is, is really stepping up their game. But then there are other places where I think there's a lot of area of, of improvement in terms of looking at how we manage things. You'll, you hear this a lot of people on, on both sides of the aisle saying, listen, follow the science. I think we need to follow the science. I think that, I think that uh, when I look at our community locally here, I look at a lot of businesses that are, uh, I, I can't even use the word struggling because it's not even a struggle anymore. It's like someone has just held them underwater for so long that I, I don't even know how they, uh, it, it must be a challenge to wake up in the morning and to, to face that. Yeah. Um, uh, but, but, you know, I support our local businesses. I support our community. And I think it is a, a very uh, challenging time to decide who stays open, who stays closed, why is, why are big big box stores open and uh, small you know small stores have such limited capacity? There there are all these different questions, and I, obviously I don't make the policy, but I, I have a sense that that uh, it's challenging to roll out policy that affects an entire state or a county or or a country, uh, and and it's hard to make those decisions uh, from a thirty thousand foot level. But when your boots on the ground, I think it's easy to second guess the decisions that those. Uh, those people have made. Um, and I don't know what the right answer is. And um, I just think that perhaps we should be very, very thoughtful and attentive about how we are uh, implementing these policies, uh, considering all the variables. And, and to me, I just, my, my heart aches for our, our community uh, uh, and, and our country, really, because this is going on all over the country. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you bring up a good point. You, you I'm sure, would look at this with a, a, a strict, uh, through a strict medical lens when, when our policymakers have to factor in so many different things. And gosh, I certainly don't, uh, don't envy uh, anybody that's, that's having to make those tough decisions right now. Um, so not to keep it too political, but let's talk about, uh, you know, the vaccine. Every, you know, we heard for months that as soon as that vaccine comes around, everything's going to be uh, smooth sailing. So how's that coming along uh, with the distribution of, uh, of the vaccine? What are you seeing and, uh, and how do you feel we're doing so far? So uh, first off, I'm going to say that Henry Mayo uh, put together a vaccine clinic in uh, an entire clinic, uh, basically a, a, a huge machine within four days uh, and was able to distribute near uh, over 1600 vaccines within a five day window uh, when we first got the vaccine, and and Henry Mayo has the Pfizer vaccine. There, the two that are out now are Pfizer and Moderna, and they're both absolutely equivalent uh, based on the data. Uh, I, I think what you said is is really accurate, which is uh, maybe the vaccine can save us from this issue. Um, I think it, it 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 if everybody in this country in the world got vaccinated today. Uh, a, about a month from now, COVID would be a non-issue, right? The, the trick is, is that we, we do have fairly high rates of declination. So if there are a fairly high rate of people who are saying, you know, I don't really know if I want this yet. Maybe I still have questions. Maybe I want to see how people who got the vaccine uh, end, end up feeling after the vaccine or how they do uh, in a longer term. Uh, at this point, uh, I think, I, I, I do think that we've seen enough people be vaccinated to know that the side effects are very mild, uh, usually lasting one to, to two or three days at the most, and, and people are tolerating the vaccine very, very well. And I think that uh, if you look at the, the big concern many people have, even I had in the beginning, is there isn't a lot of long-term safety data. However, uh, the, the vaccine 
vaccine is an th- these two vaccines are an mRNA uh, medication, and we know from other mRNA medications that are used in other patient populations that the long-term safety data is actually quite good. So I think this is something that you know this injection only affects you locally where it's injected in your shoulder. It doesn't travel throughout your body and go to your lungs or your ovaries or your testicles or anything that would that would change you as a person. It stays just in that local area, and it does its work there to help create antibodies against COVID. Uh, I think that we're seeing these different strains of COVID that are coming out and being identified. This vaccine should still work on those strains as best as we can tell. So I think there are a lot of reasons to get this vaccine. Mostly, I think if we want to get these communities open and get these businesses back going again, vaccination is a pretty easy, clear-cut path to make that happen. So I think that's very important. A second piece of that of the vaccine that I think is super important to get out to the community is that not only would I recommend you get it, we are restricted on who we can give it to based on the government telling us uh, who we can or can't give it to. Now, the vaccine is free to everyone. It's being paid for by the government. It's being distributed by the government. So essentially, we're at the mercy of the government on who we can distribute to. And we have a very interesting thing going on right now in California. Actually, I think it's important that the community knows this, is that the governor of the state has said, hey, everyone that's 65 and older, get the vaccine. But our vaccine delivery system in Los Angeles County is governed by the county. And the county has not yet provided us that guidance. They have not yet said, hey, you can open it up to 65 and older. They are currently still sticking to what's called phase 1A, which is essentially most all healthcare providers, dentists, those kinds of people. So even though you see on the news every night telling you that if you're over 65, go out and get the vaccine, if you live in L.A. County, that is not true. No uh, no what are called PODs, points of dispensing, which Henry Mayo is a point of dispensing. We are a POD. We're a pod. Uh, We are unable to provide that vaccine to people who are 65 and older, despite what you hear on the news, because we need L.A. County to tell us that 65 and older is okay. So kind of going back to what you said about how the government's running things, I think they could do that a little better. I think that L.A. County could open it up to 65 and older. I think that one of the big pieces of keeping healthcare people working and able to serve our communities is to vaccinate healthcare workers' family members. This mm. is a critical piece that is just, for lack of a better term, being missed amongst the people who are deciding who can and can't be vaccinated. So a lot of things to think about, uh, but uh, in the end, I think the vaccine is going to be our easiest, straightest path to getting things back open again. Okay, well, you make some interesting points, and I'd love to have you back on uh, uh, once things start getting a little bit more widely rolled out and and hear your input on that. I've got one last question for you, Dr. Lawrence. Uh, we are, as you know, an education-based show, and so I'd be remiss if I didn't ask uh, about your thoughts on kids uh, going back to school, especially uh, with the numbers that we're seeing. Dr. Lawrence, you're a father. You've got kids that are uh, that are still in school. Um and I asked you back in June, but in light of the spike, I want to ask again, um, how do you feel about uh, our, our, our school campuses continuing to reopen? Uh, currently, we've got some really small groups on, on different campuses, but do you feel comfortable, would you feel comfortable sending your kids uh, back to school, especially given the numbers we're seeing? So, uh, you know, that's an, that is an individual question for each sure. family each set of parents and each set of kids, I think globally from a school district perspective, I think they have a significant amount of challenges to get the schools open, um, much of which is to get the teachers on board to help get kids back in the classroom, to have PPE available, to have safe spaces for teaching. Uh, these all take efforts, uh, which I know that our school district uh, and the school districts in the Santa Cruz Valley as a whole have been pushing uh, towards and trying to make that happen. But it's a very big challenge. I think that we have to consider uh, a couple of things. First off, the mental health of our children is something that is being really stressed right now. Uh, Being out of their normal social learning environment is a huge challenge for kids. And I think that that is now, as you said, it's almost a year, starting to take its toll if it hasn't already. And I think that we need to somehow uh, get kids 
socially engaged. Now, from a personal level, I think you need to look at, for your decision, how high risk is, is your household? Now, this is one of the ways where the vaccine can come into play, is that if we can vaccinate our high-risk people, that takes, uh, you know, when kids get COVID-19, they, it, is a, it is globally a non-issue. There are some outlier cases where, uh, where people have bad outcomes that are children, but if, it, it, far and away, children do very well with COVID. That is really not a concern. It's a concern of bringing it back to the family members at home or getting the teachers infected. So if we can get our teachers immunized, we can get our high-risk family members at home immunized, that then really clears the path for bringing kids back into the classroom. Uh, it makes it much easier, I would think, for the county uh, to provide that guidance to the schools. I think there are a lot of variables here. Uh, it is not straightforward. I think if it was a perfect world, we should have all these kids back in a classroom, but we have to be realistic about the hurdles that are there uh, and the challenges uh, monetarily, for example, for a school district to sure. implement PPE and put up plastic barriers everywhere and hand sanitizers. Like, all of this stuff costs a great deal of money. And where does that money come from in a school district that is already strapped, you know, struggling to, to make sure their teachers are happy with their pay and their benefits and all these other pressures that they have? Uh, it's, it's a big challenge. So uh, I think we need to be realistic about uh, what are the resources and how things can be moved in the right direction. I think everyone's on the same page. I think everyone wants to have kids back in the classroom. I think we, I think, I think we all know that uh, having kids at home in their rooms on computers all day is not healthy in the long term uh, from a mental health standpoint or from a, just a physical health standpoint. So uh, kind of, I don't know if I really answered the question, but no. uh, that, those are my thoughts. Yeah, yeah, it, you're right. It, it really is a challenge, and, and, and I think you hit the nail on the head. It's uh, Every family is different, and every family is going to have to ultimately make those those hard decisions when we when we do start opening things up a, a little bit more. We're, we're living in some very challenging times, but uh, Dr. Lawrence, uh, you and, and the rest of your team there at Henry Mayo are, are doing such amazing work. Uh, I, I know the word hero gets thrown around, but I don't think it's thrown around uh, lightly. You guys uh, are, are just phenomenal. We're so grateful for, for the work that you do and grateful for the time that you spent with us today. We appreciate it. You take care. Thank you so much for having me, and thank you for getting the word out to our community and providing education, uh, communication uh, with our community is is so important. And I thank you for all the great work you're doing as well. Oh, absolutely. Thank you. This is SCVI and I lead schools Eye on the Valley. I'm your host, Matt Watson. Please stay tuned. We will be right back with more on your hometown station, KHTS. When you look at your child, you see so much. A creative spirit that surprises you every day. A little leader growing to discover who they are, what they love, and how they can make the world better. At SCVI, we see those same amazing things. Our tuition-free TK-12 charter school provides boundless opportunities to think critically and imagine freely with a learning program customized just for your child. Today, that means empowering your child to bring strengths and passions to the distance learning environment. Our approach keeps your child and family in step while online, inspiring your learner to keep growing without missing a beat. At SCVI, your child will find even more ways to grow with projects and activities in STEAM, robotics, theater, music, and sports. With the only international baccalaureate program in Santa Clarita, SCVI produces graduates who excel at top universities and in life. For enrollment information or to learn more about our distance learning program, visit iLeadSantaClarita.org. iLead Schools, free to think, inspired to lead. Why did Mercedes-Benz of Valencia win the Dealer of Excellence Award in 2019? Because we strive to provide the most outstanding sales experience. Mercedes-Benz of Valencia COO, Chris Paz. We know you have high expectations. Our stellar team will meet and exceed your expectations. That's why we were named Mercedes Best of the Best, placing us in the top 10% of all Mercedes dealers nationwide. Find out how you can lease a new Mercedes for unbelievably low monthly payments. Details at mbzvalencia.com. Save water and save money. SCV Water wants to help you find your fit and take advantage of conservation rebate programs that will help you save. Water your landscape more efficiently. Replace your lawn with water-wise plants. Conduct free in-home water surveys. Cover your swimming pool and more. Find the programs that fit your needs and start saving today. Visit conserve.yourscvwater.com to learn more. That's conserve.yourscvwater.com. 
your hometown station, KHTS. Welcome back. You are listening to KHTS, your hometown station, 98.1 FM and 1220 AM. I am Matt Watson, your host, and you're listening to SCVI and I Lead Schools, I on the Valley. We have had a great show today. You know, I, I've really enjoyed this show, getting a lot of information out uh, to you, our, our listener. Uh, you know, talking to Dr. Lawrence from, from Henry Mayo uh, just really drives home uh, how important it is that, uh, that we do all the things that we need to, to, to be doing to make sure that we stay safe. Um, but it's also so good to hear um, uh, how strong of a job they're doing out there at, at Henry Mayo. Um, you know, I, I, I mentioned I had a family member who, who actually has uh, had to take advantage of the amazing emergency room that we have here recently. And, and boy, was I so grateful and so comfortable uh, trusting that family member uh, to the care of the staff there at Henry Mayo. They're doing amazing things. Uh, you know, Patty, we live in such a giving community uh, that, uh, that really uh, steps up and, and, and takes care of each other. Um, if you, our listener, are, are looking to give back and, and help support those folks that are just on the uh, literal front lines and, and, and taking care of our community, um, feel free to reach out to, to the hospital at uh, henrymayo.com. And, you know, if it's just dropping off, the, the hospital put out the call. They need bottles of water. You know, our nurses, our doctors need to stay hydrated. Um, they could use snacks. Um, so if you, if you can drop off a couple of cases of water and some snacks uh, for the staff there to help keep them going, that would be so, uh, so gratefully appreciated by the staff there. And, and if you're looking to, to help them uh, in that capital campaign that Dr. Lawrence talked about to uh, help keep the, the facilities there, uh, the, the top-notch quality of facilities that, uh, that we've come to expect here in the Valley, uh, you can head on over to their foundation website. Producer Sarah's dropped that website in the chat here uh, on uh, our, our Facebook live feed, KHTS Radio Facebook Lives feed. Um, but you can just Google Henry Mayo Foundation and and make a donation there if uh, if that's something that you're willing and, and able to do. We spoke in the first hour with a couple of facilitators from Ailid Agua Dulce. Um, uh, who are just doing great things. Uh, Deja Mun, Ali Benedetti uh, are, are the middle school team at Ailid Agua Dulce who's uh, helping prepare that next generation of, of heroes and leaders for our community. And if you are interested in looking into one of our schools and, and getting your kids enrolled in a project-based curriculum uh, such as they have at SCVI and the rest of our ILEAD schools, check us out on our websites. SCVI on the west side of the valley uh, is ileadsantaclarita.org. Uh, Ileed Agua Dulce here on the east side of the valley is ileadaguadulce.org. We've also got schools in, in Lancaster, similar email address, ileadlancaster.org. We've also got uh, remote programs, uh, a vibrant homeschool program at ileadexploration.org or a full online kindergarten through 12th grade online program. A little bit different than homeschool. It's a full online program at ileadonline.org. Go ahead and check us out. I want to thank you for joining us today. Uh, I, I want to thank my guests, as I mentioned, Deja Mun and Ali Benedetti from Ili Agua Dulce and Dr. Bud Lawrence from the emergency department. He is the medical director there at the emergency department at Henry Mayo. So grateful for, for them coming in to join us today. We really appreciate it. We appreciate you uh, for for joining us. And, you know, we're heading into a, a three-day weekend. It's Martin Luther King Day on Monday. But, you know... Martin Luther King Day is not a day off. It's a day on, uh, you know, this year in uh, uh, especially. We need to look at what we can do to help better our community on, on this long weekend. Make sure you join us next week and every Friday from 8. If you need help at home.